Hi everyone. Okay, we're going to start. Um, there are seven teams in this group Z. So there are, we're going to start off with Babyhood um, from India. There's Drinkbox from Japan. Webinet from Hong Kong. Resinue from India. Sex Ed from Japan. Wotis from Japan. And Thinker from Malaysia. So we'll go in that uh, specific order. Every team will be given seven minutes to pitch followed by a seven minute uh, Q and A, right? So I'll time the session. Um, you'll hear an alarm on the fifth minute, right? And then you'll hear the second alarm. The minute you hear the second alarm, please wrap up your last sentence uh, before we end, okay? Perlin, I want to bring babyhood on board. Hello. Hi. Good luck, guys. <laughs> Ready when you are? Megan and Megan. Okay. You can start whenever you're ready. There's a bit of echo from the side. Can everyone hear and hear properly? You can be found in the Sharma household until a few days ago. Smita was on top of the world. She had her little girl cooing in her arms. Her firstborn. Her little princess. But today, there is happiness. Her arms are empty. Her baby is no more. And the only voice that she has in her head now is that the doctor said if she had brought her baby earlier, her baby could have been saved. And every moment now she wonders what if she had known her baby was sick and needed treatment a day earlier? What if she had known her baby wasn't sleepy but was sick? What if? I have heard such stories from my mother day in and day out. She's a public health specialist who works in newborn health. With these stories, I've also seen her frustration, as the solution to save many of these babies is actually not rocket science. And yet, nearly 2.5 million newborn babies die around the world each year. And worse, 26 million more will die by 2030 if nothing were done today. Imagine, so many babies will not know what the world is, like you do, like I do. We want to change this with babyhood so that these babies have a chance to survive and thrive into adulthood. Hi, I'm Anya from Team Babyhood. Many babies in the first 30 days have mild episodes of sickness and they get better. Some have severe episodes of sickness get treatment on time and get better. But then there are some who do not recover from the sickness. They die. These are the main reasons why these babies do not survive and babyhood aims to focus on the first two. Babyhood will empower parents like Smita to save lives of their babies so that they can survive and thrive into adulthood. This is the journey of a newborn baby with babyhood. On the day of delivery, the doctor will explain the app to the parents and help them download it. From 2 days to 30 days, the parents will monitor the symptoms of the baby with daily use of the babyhood app. This means that the parents will not miss any sickness symptoms and that the baby can get treated on time if needed. By day 30, we'll have a surviving newborn. We have a working prototype. This short video explains how the app works. It requires the details of the baby to be entered once, then a notification time set for the parents to answer questions daily. These are the questions. According to the answers, there are three possible outcomes. The baby is fine. The baby may be unwell. And if so, the parents will be asked to call a healthcare. 
Or the baby is unwell. And if so, the parents of the aunt make the baby do a healthcare provider. Hi, I am Megan. We have interacted with 18 parents so far, and most of them have appreciated having more knowledge and understanding of danger signs and when to seek treatment through the app. For example, a parent mentioned that she knew yellowing of eyes was a danger sign, but not the yellowing of souls. They gave us good suggestions to improve utility and user friendliness. We also presented our concept to two pharmaceutical companies. Our pitch to them was that they can advertise their drugs and baby products on the app and can support increasing awareness in the parents. They like the concept and have given us suggestions and letters of potential interest. We also have traction from clinicians. This traction from our mentor, we are super proud of. We have four tiers in our revenue model, targeting the standalone clinicians, hospitals, pharmaceutical companies, and the government. Over time, we envisage covering the variety of these stakeholders to reach more and more newborn babies. The packages are differentiated by the availability of options to advertise and sharing of anonymized data. If we reach 10% of all newborn babies born in India in a year, we can generate a revenue of 1.2 million US dollars each year at an average cost of 50 cents per baby. This revenue can increase to 4.8 million US dollars annually if we reach 40% babies in India over time each year. There is potential in other low and middle income countries as well. In the first phase, we aim to market the app to pharmaceutical companies, standalone clinicians and hospitals. We will continue to update our app based on the learnings from this experience and then connect with the government and NGOs. Media will be used to market our app. Hello, I am Gian. We see the ground situation due to COVID-19 and increasing smartphone use as an opportunity. There is no competitor yet for babyhood. No app that monitors symptoms and provides action-oriented outcomes for newborn babies. This is the team babyhood. Three of us, our mentors, IT consultant, data scientist and advisor. Team Babyhood is excited to play its part in achieving the SDGs. Babyhood will facilitate taking forward the every newborn action plan. Let us do all we can to ensure a healthy start for all newborns. Thank you. Thank you. So you guys, you're done with your pitch. Okay, we'll move on to Q&A and any of the judges have any questions to, to start? Yeah, maybe I could start. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Um, I want to understand a bit more about sort of the business model as well as the, you know, how you're able to generate revenue. Um, so the cost of de developing the prototype app has been very low so far and we anticipate that the cost of fully development of the app will be modest. On the other hand, a potential to generate revenue is high. So we plan to sell the app at an average cost of 50 cents to pharmaceutical companies, healthcare providers, hospitals and government agencies. So if the app is used for 40% of the newborns in India, the revenue will be about 5 million US dollars every year. And if we eventually reach 20% of the newborns in low and middle income countries, the revenue will be um, 12 million US dollars every year. Okay, got it. <clears throat> and then in terms of some of the, let's say, the, the health outcomes, do you have anything that you can measure in terms of how your app is able to improve specific health outcomes? So our app will, um, so the goal of our app is to reduce neonatal mortality. 
Yeah, got it. But do you have any, let's say, figures to show the, the efficacy, like, you know, in terms of like, you know, based on like previous studies or your own internal data sets? So, um, 2.5 million babies die in the world each year, and we want to reduce that. So there is no competitor yet in the market, but there are some people who, um, like uh, we're focusing on the doctors or the hospitals, but we're directly focusing um, on the patients and we're going to sell our application to the doctor, uh, the doctors, um, the clinicians, hospitals, pharma and the government agencies. So the fast. Yes. So that's what. I think uh, what Dr. Dada was trying to ask is whether there is an evidence-based study to prove that by using your app, there is an increase in um, uh, the outcome of the baby's life. Yeah. So nobody has actually done anything like this before. And the adults, have, like other companies, have attempted to solve this crisis. But nobody has made like an um, application base and they're not focusing mostly on the patients and um, we're mainly focusing only for the first month of life. So we're, um, we're sure that this application is going to work because nobody else has done this before. We've also connected to some um, patients and um, pediatricians, doctors and clinicians and they really like our idea. Pharmaceutical, two pharmaceutical companies are also interested in um, helping us. So we're 100% sure that this uh, application is going to work. So, uh, we so you first oh, sorry, go ahead. So, um, we, so it, the, um, uh, research shows that if parents understand the symptoms of their babies better and know when they're sick, then the babies can get treatment on time and we still have to test the app in the market on a lot. That's great. Thank you very much. Yeah, definitely. Uh, good job, guys, on uh, identifying something where the problem statements are uh, quite strong. Um, I, I do agree that it's difficult at this point for you to be able to prove uh, statistically what your app is able to do. But maybe if you can take a little bit of a step back um, with why is it that you came up with this story? And especially what you said, Anya, um, if parents are aware of what the steps that they need to monitor for, then maybe that would help with the metrics. But maybe can you take us a little bit through the story of uh, which are the parents that you are targeting and what are the maybe health signs that they may not necessarily be aware? Or is the problem statement also something about um, access to doctors? Uh, are they reacting too late? Are they missing signs? Maybe take us through that, that pinpoint, uh, which will then, I think, bring up the experience of what you're building on that a lot better. So we are targeting underprivileged parents and underprivileged people because they don't understand it because they haven't been educated enough. And so they, there are, it's both the reasons. So they're not educated enough and sometimes they don't have access to a doctor. Okay. Um, are there specific health signs um, that is necessary for the education? Is it is it that the baby is having a temperature? Is it certain other symptoms that you you guys were able to um, either through the, the the pharma companies that you've talked to or with doctors that you talked to that you identified are the one or two things that you want your app to be able to communicate to the parents? So. Um we use the symptoms that are in the neonatal guidelines. By which are those symptoms? Yeah, which are those symptoms? Yeah. Um, so in our questions, we're focusing on the um, uh, the a fever um, or yellowing of soul, uh, like vomiting. So there are so we've made these questions based on the help from our um, advisors. advisors and mentors. And we've made these 12 list of questions which the parents will receive on a daily basis. So we've considered most of the signs and symptoms. And um, yes, that, that, and uh, we, we want to guide the parents so that the, the babies don't die in the first month of life and so that they can survive and thrive into adulthood.
and um, these symptoms uh, are like of common diseases like pneumonia and they can be of bacterial infections diarrhea yeah perfect so i mean uh, recommendation for me i think you you guys hit on a pain point where the the first thing that's important is making sure that you're educating parents um to be honest it is difficult to educate someone if they have to mo uh, download a mobile application because then there's a bit of a uh, a few steps that they have to jump through um, even a simple website with the same form that you have would be a way to reach out to them um, so, one key um, the, the uh, doctors and the uh, it, so the application will be downloaded by the doctors and the hospital so we will provide the package to the doctors hospital clinicians and they will download the app for them. Yeah. So they will explain it to the parents so that they fully understand it and can use it. Yeah. Um, I think my suggestion is that there is links to this idea. Um, if you have a, a, a tie up with doctors where the doc doctor is bringing a patient through the app, that is perfect. Uh, but at the same time, there are also doctors that you may not be able to reach. Um, and then you're missing patients that, that see those doctors. So the easiest way for you to be able to communicate this information of what are the important questions that they need to look out for, um, whether it's a website that you can publish, whether it's uh, even social media that might be available for them. I think that is the key step because the revenue model that you're looking at is 50 cents. Um, it's not very high. I think if you raise a lot more awareness around uh, neonatal mortality, uh, this could also be something where other people may contribute from a social enterprise perspective to make sure that this reaches out as many, to as many people as possible. One um, very valid point. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Uh, the Q&A time is up. Sorry, we have to bring in the next team. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much you. for your suggestion. Yeah, we'll got an idea. Next, next up, we have uh, Drinkbox from Japan. Perlin, uh, could you kindly bring them in? Colin, you're there. Uh, I've actually added okay. them cool. ready. Up. Great, thank you. Okay, we've got everyone from Drinkbox. Um, Adam, Adam, your team is on. All right. We're missing one more person. Okay, we can start whenever you're ready. We're actually missing one person right now. Oh, uh, who's that? Kyler Caldwell. Um, okay, uh, Perlin, you think you can assist him? Um, I actually send the invite over. I'm just waiting for his response. Oh. My Any... Would you be able to start without him or do you uh... need to wait? It's going to be a bit of a problem, I can say, yeah. Put Kai receive the rest. Kyle just uh, put in the chat that he hasn't received an invite yet. Could you resend it to him? Okay, sure. I've invited, so he should have received it right now. Yeah, I, I believe everyone in the team is here. Hello, sorry about that. Okay, great. Um, okay. Okay, you can start when you're ready. Um, is my screen visible? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, um, can you guys all hear me? Yeah. My name is Adam, and today I'm here with my colleagues, Kyler and Eddie, and today we're here to present Drinkbox. Japan my entire life, and ever since I was a young boy, I've known that plastic waste in Japan is a problem. But not until the summer of 2020 did I truly realize this. When me and my friends decided to go to the beach during the summer, we chose a place in the middle of nowhere due to COVID. When I got there, my eyes scattered the horizon, and I saw a looming monstrosity of plastic bottles inside the ocean. In the middle of nowhere, I witnessed a crisis unfold right in front of my eyes. 
According to official crusaders, each year, 100,000 aquatic animals die because of plastic pollution. I constantly hear people say that they're going to make changes, but where is this change? This is when we realized that we needed to be the ones to make the change, to not only save our lives, but to save the lives of the animals and to save the lives of the people of tomorrow. So after considering all the sources of plastic waste in Japan, we narrowed it down to plastic bottles and vending machines. Currently, across the nation, there are 740 plastic bottles purchased every second. There is also one vending machine for every 23 people. This number of plastic production and the population density of vending machines is astronomically high and must be lowered if we want to fight the climate crisis that Japan has deemed a national emergency. And so, we got our heads together and came up with our product, Drinkbox. Drinkbox is a vending machine that does not use plastic bottles, but instead uses your own refillable water bottles. Drinkbox actually operates quite similarly to a regular vending machine in Japan. Save payment options, cash, Suica, Apple Pay, Plasmo. Drinkbox also has three different refillable water bottle stations, as you can see in the image. Drinkbox also has six different drinks inside the vending machine at all times, depending on what drink is on demand at that time. Drinkbox also has a feature in which you can choose the number of milliliters you want inside your drink, ranging from 350ml, 500ml, and 750ml. The price varies based on the drink you get and the number of ml you get in the drink. In addition, Drinkbox also has a UV light to disinfect and sanitize the vending machines. Along with all the features Adam mentioned, a great aspect of Drinkbox is that the internal specs are similar to a soda dispenser. So the price of the machine would account for the same parts, the reformatting of the Drinkbox structure, and the additional features Adam mentioned, rounding in at approximately $3,500 per unit, not including the reduction that comes with mass production. We plan to install Drinkbox in schools, which typically provide locations for vending machines for free or lease location in exchange for a small profit of revenue from the drink sold. Electricity is also provided by location no matter what, and maintenance to refill and keep up the quality of the product of the Drinkbox costs approximately $12 to $20 an hour by employees employed by Drinkbox. The cost of a drink box is almost identical to a standard vending machine in Japan. As my colleague Kyler mentioned, we are targeting high school and college campuses. And this is because in the younger generations, students are always more environmentally aware and politically active. And this plays into our advantage. We surveyed our student body and found that where 70% of all students carry a water bottle daily to their workplace and uh, school, 87% would also, given the opportunity, would fill their water bottles with drinks from vending machines if as an alternative to plastic bottles. So we then tested this. Because it would be unwise to install vending machines off of hypothetical data, we made a prototype. We tested our minimum viable product, setting up a table during a 30 minute lunch period, offering to fill water bottles with various teas, coffees, and sodas. And we served portions at 350, 500, and 750 milliliters, selling at 100, 150, and 200 yen respectively. Having different serving sizes gives us a unique advantage against vending machines, as vending machines are static and can only serve the preset amounts that they create with their plastic bottles. This feature has a viable place in, our, in the market. Our sales da data concluded that while 60% of our sales were at 500 milliliters, 22% of our sales were at 350 milliliters, and 18% of our sales were at 750 milliliters. And this all demonstrates the potential of having the unique feature of choosing your own serving size. And uh, now I'll present our profit margins. Uh, so these are our, our profit margins for our four most popular drinks. And I just wanted to highlight uh, Oyo Cha, which is a green tea that is very popular in Japan. And uh, it also had our highest profit margins, uh, ranging from uh, 160% to 200. We have three different phases in our business. We recently completed the first phase of the talk through research and whether or not people were interested in our product and whether or not people were willing to pay for our product, in which they did. Our customers were intrigued that the vending machine is environmentally friendly, as well as they were intrigued by the feature that you can choose a number of milliliters inside your drink. This was a compelling argument for them to support Drinkbox. We believe that gathering information through tests is much more valuable than gathering information through surveys. Hence, for phase two, we plan to install cheap prototypes in different locations and gather information through data on how well the vending machines are performing. If this all goes smoothly, we will then move on to phase three, which is installing a vending machine in school campuses. 
We believe that by following these three phases, uh, we can ensure that our business will be successful. Now, let's meet our team. I'm Adam Platic, co-founder of Drinkbox and head marketer in Bass Sanitizer. I am Eddie Rogers, co-founder of Drinkbox and also co-founder and CEO of the Students Against the Virus Entrepreneurship Program. My name is Kyler Caldwell, I'm co-founder of Drinkbox and founder and CEO of Genki Products Japan. And with your help, we think that we can save the world one drink at a time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys, great job. Um, we'll move on to Q&A. Okay, maybe I'll start. Uh, thank you very much. It was a really great presentation. Um, I want to understand in terms of like, you know, how you're, you're able to scale. Um, I know you mentioned that you're targeting, uh, let's say, schools and university campuses. Could you tell us a little bit about sort of the, um, the total available market in Japan? Um, and then, you know, based on the, the demographic that you're, you're targeting. Yeah, so um, the, uh, we would start the initial rollout international schools typically like high schools and middle schools are, are, are all off the house vending machine and are more lenient to these more new uh, ventures. But, um, and once we expand then to universities, we plan to sort of gradually have a slower rollout towards different uh, universities. And once we build credibility, then go to more public schools who um, also all, all have vending machines on their campuses. Got it. And then do you, do you like, can you, uh, let's say, assess the size of the market, especially when you compare it to like traditional vending machines like that use plastic bottles? Anyone want to take a gander? Um, yeah, um, as Kyler mentioned, um, once we build credibility, we believe that, as also Kyler mentioned, there's one in 23 people for each vending machine in Japan. There's nearly, I think, 4 million vending machines in Japan. Everyone uses vending machines in Japan. So once we do get credibility for our product, we know that there is a huge market in vending machines in Japan. And we think that people in Japan will understand that the environment does make sense and it does matter, and hence they will use our product. And um, in recent months, actually, Japan has been making, uh, having to make more advancements towards sustainable practices. They just recently started charging people for plastic bags, which is not... You know, it's a really tiny step, but it's a big step for something that Japan hasn't really been conscious about. And more, uh, also businesses in Japan are being held accountable for their plastic uh, use. And so we think that our goal is to sort of be able to uh, pitch the schools to be more sustainable and to replace their current plastic, uh, their vending machines with these different plastics. Got it. And just a follow up question. I know you mentioned that you, you have, of course, food safety in mind and you use sort of a UV, UV application to sterilize uh, certain aspects. Does that include the extruder nozzle like for dispensing? Uh, so, yeah. Uh, and the UV light uh, has also been used in uh, hospitals and businesses, and it's sort of a standard not in the vending machine industry, but uh, certainly in other industries. So we think it can apply here, too. OK, got it. thank you. Yeah, maybe I'll go. Um, thanks, guys, for the presentation. I think it's an interesting idea. Uh, Japan, especially, I think, has a, has a pretty intriguing mix of a lot of convenience kind of uh, outlets and machines, but also a very high level of awareness about recycling, right? Really strong practices there. So I guess I'm curious about, uh, I don't know whether you can answer this question or whether I, I can put it correctly, but basically from a behavior standpoint, right? Uh, what do you think of the adoption about this at scale, right? So in schools, I think adoption will be more straightforward, but when, when you kind of move into phase three, for, for instance, and start rolling it out, um, what are some of the barriers to adoption that you see? And, um, you know, kind of what are some of the challenges that you are predicting and how do you plan to overcome that? So obviously, um, I think the biggest challenge is that there are current vending machines that already exist. And all you have to do right now is basically just click a button and a plastic bottle falls, right? So it's a little bit quicker. People that are in a really big rush might prefer to do something like that. So that's probably our um, limitation. Um, so what was your second part of the question? You asked that and... How, how, how do you kind of plan to overcome that? Um, because from two perspectives, right? One, I think, is, is convenience. Um, and so I guess you will have a class of consumers or potential 
yeah, potential consumers who really are looking at um, convenience rather than kind of having to bring their own things up. Um, and I guess the other thing is just in relation to operationalizing this, right? Whether it's building your uh, your machine in such a way that it you, you can actually achieve the outcome that you're trying to get at scale, make sure you deliver a clean and safe product. Um, and then, you know, also making sure that you, you get the kind of wide, widespread adoption that you're aiming for. What are some of the some of the barriers uh, that you might foresee? Um, maybe another way to put this is also why hasn't this idea taken off yet uh, in, in Japan, where there is a very strong sustainable mindset? So, um, one of the, sorry, I'm hearing a bit of echo, but um, I'll, I'll try my, I'll struggle through it. But um, I think that the reason why, to answer the last part first, that it hasn't taken off in Japan is because this movement for sustainability is very, very recent. And Japan, it's it's starting, it's definitely on the uprise um, with more social media. I've seen uh, pop stars in Japan that are starting to take more climate action and there's more activism in the streets. Um, with some of the barriers that we do see is obviously it does re rely on people carrying a water bottle. And so when we think that it'll be effective when going into uh, private schools or um, and eventually to other public high schools when almost all Japanese kids do carry a water bottle, I can say from experience. But um, when we get to the university level with vending machines are more sparse around campus, I think that uh, we were also uh, considering going into uh, private offices as well it's, um, as uh, sort of like an introductory step towards the eventually getting to the university level because um, in one of my pre in a separate venture from Drinkbox, I've been communicating with lots of offices in you know SoftBank and Amazon and uh, in the Tokyo offices, which are some of the largest offices around Tokyo. And... Um, and they almost all of the employees are now starting to bring their own plastic bottles with more installation of water fountains and drinking uh, re to refill drinks around the offices. OK, thanks. Thank you. Interesting. I think one one question from me um, in terms of um, the whole setup itself. Have you thought about the cost, the technologies, the engineering, you know, how, how are you going to do something like this? So, yeah, so that is, uh, that was one of our biggest concerns when beginning this venture. Uh, we are obviously not engineers, we're still students, but um, in high school, but we, when we were considering this product in the first place, we thought that um, it was through sort of the reformatting of the internals of a drinking fountain. With, with it's the similar uh, concept in that it's just like sort of a sort of an evolution of what a drinking fountain is. And so we would obviously, you know, begin to consult if we were moving into the next stage with mechanics and with engineers. We have um, a specific like plastic uh, sorry, a cube that goes through which you put like syrups, like you do like uh, a soda stream and stuff like that. And that's how we're planning to like go through. And yeah, so that's it. Okay. Sure, guys need to cut you off there. Uh, seven minutes up. Thank you for the presentation. Great job, guys. Uh, we'll move on to the next team, Webinet from Hong Kong. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, my teammate isn't on the phone yet. Is your colleague on? Is your team on? Not yet, I'm still waiting for the Alright, just give it a minute. Hello, hi Nicole. Hi, hi. Okay. okay, just the two of you, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Um, we can start whenever you're ready. Oh, sorry. Let me just share my screen real quick. Sure. Okay then. 
three, two, one. Hi, I'm Nicole. And I'm Leanne. We're both co-founders of Webinet. It's every child's dream to attend the most prestigious university, get a good job and be content for what they choose as their career. For me, this plan will get go into action in a few years' time, and I want to be able to go to Oxford or Cambridge University. I want to be the best in my field, and I want to choose a subject that speaks to me, something that I can pursue in my lifetime. And for me, well, I've always wanted to be an innovator when I grow up. I want to change the world, help it become a better place. But how can I do that, and how can I find the right resources that can help benefit me outside of my classroom? There's simply too much information that I'm prone to missing out on. How do I know if my skills are relevant to the real world? God, it's scary to even think about it. For such a daunting task, I'm unsure of what major I should apply for. I thought I would have been able to choose this major ages ago, like how my friends did. But now I'm confused as ever on how I should approach this, or even where I should start. Sadly, this has been a huge problem to many of the students like us, and we simply don't have the time to waste on hours of researching, only to just find the tiniest percentage of resources over a scattered internet. Do you hear that? That's a sound of one hour, two hours, and five hours lost. To be the best of the best, you need to get the best, and that's where Webinet comes in. Webinet is a platform that empowers students with the right resources they need for this specific career pathway all in one place. Instead of going through all that hassle just to find the right resources for you, Webinet brings them to the comfort of your house at the tip of your fingers. All that time wasted for inefficient research, forget about it. Our main vision is to help strengthen student skills for the real world, whether it's advancing to university or going forward in their careers. We aim to provide a diverse, connected platform that gives young adults and keen learners the chance to explore their interests through webinars and courses hosted by universities and businesses. By the year 2025, the global e-learning market size will be at $325 billion, and 90% of energy consumption will be cut because of e-learning. E-learning is proven to be five times more effective than traditional face-to-face -face lessons. So, our total addressable market is $107 billion, the serviceable addressable market is $105 billion, and the serviceable obtainable market is about $4 million. Key features. Our platform would provide monthly updates of upcoming webinars, on-demand pre-recorded webinars, and courses hosted by universities and businesses all in one place. Young adults from all around the world would be able to join our platform. Here's our app's prototype. As you can see, we provide a user-friendly design that helps aid students with the best user experience on our app. On your left, we have a range of courses related to the user searches. In the center, we have a search function that helps navigate the user to the most relevant and popular courses, as well as providing different tabs of fields that are related to the user's interests, depending on their recent searches, quiz results, as well as their registered webinars. On your right, we have it also has we also have an integrated registration function, which helps them make the user uh, easily sign up for our platform. Here is also our landing page. It will be a website that is launched in 2021. So Leanne, what makes us so unique? Do you know what these companies are all have in common? They don't have both courses and webinars all in one place. This is why our platform is so valuable. With one price a month and occasional discounts, students and young adults get access to unlimited webinars and courses from a wide range of fields. So you may be wondering, how much will the re revenue be? For businesses and universities to host, it will be $45 for free hosts. The host will share one account under the company or university name. For one student account, it would cost $5 for unlimited access to webinars and courses. And for organizations and charities to host, it would cost $20 for three hosts. Here's our business model and value proposition. Who's our target audience? Well, from the demand side, young adults who are unsure of what to pursue in the future. Webinet gives them an advantage and support. From the supply side, professionals who aim to attract youth and want to talk about what it's like to be in their industry. This will improve their brand visibility and improve their relationships with youth. Under each webinar and course, there will be a level stated to show the difficulty of the content, so users can choose accordingly. We are a two-sided marketplace. We charge both sides. However, hosts will be also be able to profit because they'll be allowed to charge participants to join their webinar or course. We will take a percentage of that charge, though.
So Rianne, how will we get our customers? Here are our go-to market strategies. We have family, friends and schools. Firstly, on the customer side, we will recruit students who are interested in managing internationally. We will have student ambassadors from different countries and schools, and we will build the right incentives for students to join. For example, they could get free access to our platform. The result is, this will cause a chain reaction. We will also have advertisements on social media to expose more people on our platform. And we plan to set up multiple contact points so that a wider audience can be exposed to our app. We will have referral codes to get more customers. For every 15 times someone's personal code is used, the person who gave out the code will get one month free. Organizers are also going to post on their social medias when they have upcoming events. These posts will grow our consumer base. As of now, we have 115 recommendations from users from our survey. 11 letters of intent from companies and 10 paying customers. Our minimum viable product is a bearable version of our vision for the future. As of now, our MVP is a monthly spreadsheet that includes links to a large range of webinars and courses from professionals all around the world. We sorted them into several categories. Even our MVP is proven to be useful with interested customers all around the world and already paying customers. Here's our 11 partners that we have expressed interest into our concept. One company that expressed immense interest is China Zhongwan. They are a world-leading fabricated aluminum company, having over 9 million Hong Kong dollars as their market capitalization. Another company is Own Academy. They're a company that bridges the gap between schools and the real world. We have letters of intent from all these companies, and they all want to partner with us. And these companies have said that our platform is the perfect solution, as it is highly efficient, cost-effective, and extremely practical. Based on our final financial calculations, our yearly profit will be a whopping $503,000 in just two years. Right now, we already have our MVP and our partners. Our entire school has been introduced to Webinet as we've shared our platform with our principal. We plan to have our release candidate ready by mid-late 2021, or even earlier if we secure enough funding to develop the platform. This candidate will include user-specific features as well as host, host within the platform itself instead of us just being the linking page. We will launch our platform shortly after that. Thank you, and let's web in net. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, we'll move on to Q&A. Thanks, guys. Uh, let me go first. Um, thanks, Nicole, Leanne. Yeah. You guys are in high school, right? Yes, yeah. we're 14 years old. OK. Yeah, OK. So I think I think you're going after two propositions. So I wanted to um, clarify which ones you think is uh, more relevant to you guys as individuals. So the first one that you're going for was real world learning. Um, I don't think mathematics is kind of real world learning, which is the example that you gave, um, which is why I'm, I, I do my question for you is um, if you launch this, uh, this platform as users yourself, looking at what are the important journeys that's important to you, uh, what are the areas that you think would be um, something that you would sign up for as a user and want to consume? Because to be honest, in your segment, Minecraft is a lot more engaging than this. So for, <laughs> For you to build a platform looking at e-learning, I think the most important thing to look at is how do you engage users and how do you keep them off Minecraft so that they come they come here. Uh, I think the second proposition that you were alluding to a little bit, which I think you are not following up through, is uh, basically placements in universities. I think that's a much smaller opportunity that you can go for. The, the e-learning space, especially if you have a format that's a lot more engaging, um, will be more effective. So maybe if uh, from your point of view in your interest areas, what are the 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 areas that you don't get learning in school, but you will go to a platform like this and which is will be more engaging so that you can learn something else. So we we provide real world real world learning and basically there's different fields and topics, right? So if you go to for example um, the company that Nicole mentioned, China Zhongwang, it's an aluminum company, right? If we go to that tab, we will learn about the future of aluminum and how, like, the field will progress. 
Right, yeah. Um, for China Zhongwang, it's uh, basically an aluminium company that helps with manufacturing aluminium as well as using it in the industry. And for us in school especially, um, we don't get that chance. We don't get the opportunity to learn this and have this valuable, um, you know, like we're not exposed towards the real life skills that, um, you know, for example, like uh, in industrial learning, engineering, or, you know, maybe drama, you know, like uh, acting and producing, you know, all those different kinds of fields we're just missing out on in school. And so this platform will allow students to understand these skills that can be used in the real world and, uh, and you know, teach kind of them, consider them, yeah, consider them in their career paths. Uh, in the future. So it is very valuable to us um, as students as well as other students I can speak for. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think I saw in your respondents as well, um, the feedback that you got where a lot of the topics that they were asking for are things like dance, theatre, art, fashion, film. Um, so based on those topics with, if, with the right partners that are coming in, uh, what do you think would be a nice format to have on the platform that would keep people engaged on like a topic like dance or film? Well... Um, we can take, for example, the Young Founders Submit Asia. They have the chat function, they can have lounges, they can have teams of groups that can uh, discuss with each other, um, as well as uh, interactive games and probably, uh, you know, we can answer questions uh, and ask the, you know, not idols, but they like They can do experts. group work and like just group activities. Right, um, yeah. Because of this COVID situation, we can't really go out. so. Over the virtual world, we will be able to meet new people and learn new skills. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. No problem. I've got a question, um, and it's something related to a country specifically. So if we look at Singapore, for example, um, they have what we call a learning management system that's very centralized and controlled by the government itself. So as a business model itself, looking at what you've currently built up, how would you then, you know, try to penetrate countries like that, for example, like to bring it to the schools and so on as well? Um, we're going to have student ambassadors that can um, expose our platform to their school and the people at their school would then share with other people. And that's like a chain reaction that happens. Um. Sorry, was your question about uh, basically our curriculum or would you mean um, like the students uh, being international? Sorry, could you clarify? Right. So, so just imagine if the, the whole country has a centralized platform um, or what they call SLS in Singapore, how would you then push your contents or even your platform into that country itself? It's just a oh, yeah, key right. to find your topic. That's about, yeah. Right. So first of all, we will share our platform to a large amount of people and a large community. And this will have the incentive for the centralized, um, sorry, centralized place in uh, Singapore to government. You know, yeah. Right. Centralized government to, um, you know, come to our platform and also, you know, teach uh, their curriculums or teach uh, their topics that they want to cover up. So, um, yeah, we want to first make a large uh, community and a diverse community internationally. And this will boost our company um, to more centralized and more professional governments. Um, is that your question? Yep. Okay. Uh, will there be any other? We've got about 50 seconds left. Any last questions? Um, yeah. Maybe just one for me, because if I if I understand correctly, you're basically thinking of a two-sided platform where you're able to bring students from, I guess, high school onwards yeah. um, to essentially get a first-hand view into some of the different companies and industries. Uh, so they're better informed to make their decisions when they go to college or, or look for a job. Um, yeah. That kind of requires quite a wide, uh, quite a large amount of content or quite a wide range of different sort of partners to come on board and actually put their content or their info, host webinars and all that. Uh, how do you plan to kind of scale up 
that side of things because it's basically enterprise sales in, in a way, right? Which tends to be quite time consuming. And uh, secondly, what are your thoughts around any kind of quality control or uh, developing the tech side of things? Do any of you? Have so for the first question, oh, um, our I partners are from different fields. So they can cover like different fields and they have connections as well. So they may tell other companies about our platform. And then for the second question, we have, we will have content moderators that will like skim and like watch the content before the content is actually posted. Right. Um, and also uh, adding to what Leanne said um, about the expanding kind of the community, um, we are trying to, uh, as we said, we are trying to recruit ambassadors both uh, inside Hong Kong as well as internationally. So we plan to send multiple contact points in order to, to you know, um, spread the word more and, uh, you know, advertise our company in social medias uh, to expose a larger audience to come to our platform. Uh, yeah, trying to what Leanne said as well for the uh, monetization uh, for the content, uh, we will have an in-house team that uh, will you know, check the contents and uh, there will be a flag system. So if users think that this content is inappropriate, they will send it back to us and we will, um, you know, go from there. All right, thank you girls. Thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. You guys did a good job in presenting though. Thank you. Great job, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Next up is uh, Resinu from India. Yeah, thank you, Lian and Nicole. I've added a few members of Resinu. I'm just waiting for one more member to join in. And sure. it should be there. How, how many more members? Just one, one more. more. So, Raghav is here, Jain is here, then left. Uh, till then, can I share my screen? Yeah, yep, sure. go ahead. Um, how do I leave the Okay. Stay on the platform. Stay on the platform. <laughs> uh, Actually, okay. a third member might not be able to join. So I think we can uh, start without him. Oh, okay, matter. go ahead. This is a bowl of rice. Aman, who is a farmer. Uh, wait, uh, Raka, you need to share. Your, we can see your slides. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, is it visible now? No. Okay, now, yeah. We are Very good. Yeah. yeah. This is a bowl of rice. Aman, who is a farmer in Punjab, has to stop for six months so that he can deliver this delicious bowl of rice. But even after he has harvested this crop, he is faced with this challenge. He has to clear the field of rice stalks and he has three options to do that. He can either burn the stubble, he can sell it to industries that he is not aware of or he can buy a very expensive machinery to incorporate the stubble back into the soil. And he decides to burn it because burning is a very convenient option. It, it is not only less time consuming but it also requires no financial capital. It literally just requires a matchstick. And Aman is not alone in his decision to burn stubble. Because of stubble burning, there is immense air pollution, which not only affects the residents of Punjab, but also people of people of Delhi, like me. And so I founded Carryable, which is a venture to convert rice husks into handbags. And throughout this venture, I realized that I alone couldn't solve this issue. This issue required the role of multiple stakeholders, and this led to the birth of Resinu. Resinu is the new way to manage crop residue. It is an online marketplace to connect farmers with agricultural industries and individuals to put an end to farm fires as a whole. Now, as you know, apart from air pollution, stubble burning also damages soil quality. That means that it decreases the yield for farmers. And, you know, if not burned, crop residue can be used to make a variety of products. It can be used to make bioenergy, handicrafts, and it can be used to feed the cattle. And because it's, because it's not used for these purposes, the estimated loss comes estimated loss of burning comes out to be 30 billion dollars annually and so this figure from the world bank shows that stubble burning is not just limited to india 
It is prevalent in China, USA, Africa and the entire world. Now we conducted a telephonic interview with 25 farmers and 23 of them wanted to sell the stubble but they did not have any mechanism to do so. And many of them were unable to buy machines because of inadequate subsidies or high interest rates on loans. Likewise, startups like Carryable face the issue of establishing connection with, connections with farmers in rural areas. That's where we come in. By providing a platform for farmers to connect with these startups, Resnew becomes a residue pickup collection service. And here, the farmers can not only sell their stubble to industries, but they can also start a fundraiser if they face any financial difficulty. We know that the fundraiser option would be successful because out of because 73 out of 80 urban residents wanted to help farmers, but they did not have, they didn't have any means to do so. And 64 of them would want to use a map to donate funds to farmers. So this is a broad overview of how Resnew works. Um, so farmers can choose the industry based on the input, uh, uh, location that they've inputted. They can strike a deal and Resnew arranges for safe transportation. And based, based on their experience, they can share it with other farmers. They can ask questions. And of course, in the future, we're also planning to have an e-commerce platform wherein the industries and startups can market their products that are made out of stubble. So here's a small app demo that we have, uh, we have prepared. This is our app demo. First, we have the sign up page. Here, you'll have to input all your details. Then, you'll be sent a verification code. Finally, we also ask industries and farmers to share their location so that they can get the best matches. Based on the information and the location that the farmers have shared, we create a list of recommended industries. For example, if a farmer, if, for example, if a farmer wants to select Behar NGO, they can simply click on it and for example, if I want to save the industry for later, I can access that in the save for later section. Then we have also created a community page where farmers and industries can share their grievances and rate their experiences. Next comes the market validation and size. So, we know that 92 million metric tons of stubble is burned every year and we also have a very huge market of 1.7 million farmers in two states of India alone and our SOM comes out to be 70,000 farmers if you assume a 10% market share. Now as far as, far as our workforce is concerned, we will be employing 10 truck drivers who will be responsible for the transport of stubble from the fields to industries and as I've talked about this before, stubble has a huge demand. Our business model. We basically rely on three uh, three verticals for res uh, for revenue. First is commission, second advertisements, and third miscellaneous. So we'll be charging commissions from industries and users who donate uh, using our portal. We'll be uh, having well targeted ads for farmers on farmer welfare, agricultural equipment, and fertilizers. And lastly, we'll be also relying on CSR initiatives and our e-commerce platform in the future for additional res revenue generation. Traction. So in the, uh, in the past few months, we've collaborated with startups like Carryable, Project Fridhi and Sabiko that utilize Stubble to make products. And we have an ongoing dialogue with three of the most largest, three of the largest biomass industries in Punjab and Haryana. We also have a huge farmer base in, in Punjab, Haryana, Uttarakhand and Uttar Pradesh. Moreover, we feel that we also need to raise awareness among farmers and users so that um, so they are aware, aware about this issue and in this regard we conducted a panel discussion with over 150 plus attendees. So this is um, a small video which um, which introduces you to the farmers base that we have. Um,
So now comes our business model. So taking in in consideration all the costs and and uh, estimating that we'll be selling five thousand tons um, in the first year, we have a realistic net profit of five thousand dollars in the first year. We'll not be going into losses. We have a profit in the first year, even if it's a small profit. So our competitors. So revenue stands out because it is affordable for both the farmers and the industries, and it is profitable and it is farmer. This is our go-to-market strategy slide, wherein uh, we'll be reaching out to farmer NGOs, key politicians and influencers, and even radio and TV channels dedicated to farmers. This is our timeline, and we aim to establish nationwide connections by April 2022. Our team, and finally our set of advisors. Thank you. Thank you, guys. On moving on to Q and A. Yeah, maybe I'll start with the first question. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, you know, just just like a comment first, but I want to hear your thoughts about it. So, with any waste, um, let's say the the supply and demand will ultimately affect the price points. So, in um, in Hong Kong and China, like they Hong Kong, for instance, sells a lot of its plastic waste to China, and there was a specific year where um, let's say the price points were so low it was cheaper for them to actually dump it rather than sell it for recycling so i'm just curious do you have this incorporated into your model some of those price fluctuations depending on the yeah the availability of this waste product oh uh, yeah so basically what we're trying to do is that in order to ensure in order to ensure that farmers are also um Earning profit and industries can 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 get the stuff at affordable prices. We are trying to reach a consensus with the farmers and the industries, but we'll also let the free forces of market determine how the prices function. Because after conversing with so many farmers, they if they can get any amount of profit by selling stubble, they are willing to do that. But we but but we, okay, bearing that in mind, we don't want to exploit them financially, but and give them their fair share uh, for selling stubble and supply them to the industries at a fair price. So in that way, um, the, the difference that is created between these prices is our commission uh, revenue that we generate. So would you would you ultimately fix the price or you would just leave it for the open market? Yeah, yeah. so initially we thought of fixing the price, but we will, um, in case things don't work out, we will we'll try to fix the, fix the market price. But otherwise, we let the free forces of market uh, demand and supply to, to influence the price. Okay, got it. Thank you very much. I think maybe some uh, clarifications because uh, this is completely new to me. Um, in terms of the stubble that you're talking about, you mentioned that there is demand. Um, from a farmer perspective, um, I assume that you're looking at uh, India as a start, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, I think the pandemic especially affected farmers in that the entire supply chain that they have for the main crop was actually disrupted. So in, in I think in the conversations that you were having with the farmers, was that still a concern where am I still able to make money from my, my, my primary crop? And in an ideal situation with your platform, uh, allowing them to be able to also sell the stubble, in an ideal situation for the farmer, um, how much of their revenue do you think would come from main crop versus uh, crop residue? So actually, uh, there's a quite a complicated answer to this. So in India, there are actually farmer protests going on because the government has introduced this new bill regarding the collection and the procurement of, of crops, especially rice that we are targeting. But the thing is that rice is the most profitable crop for farmers in Punjab. They get a very high um, MSP. So what happens is that we are getting revenue from there. And since there is so much residue that is left after the rice is harvested, they want to just get, get rid of it. And by providing them transportation of no cost, they are just getting an additional source of revenue. They're getting money from their crops. If you disregard, if you disregard the, the farmer protest situation right now, earlier they used to get a fair amount of money for selling the rice crop. And now they're also getting an additional source of re revenue, uh, additional source of income by selling the, say, stocks to us and then we transport it to the industries. Any further questions from anyone? If not, thank you guys. We'll probably move on to the next team. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks, you. guys. Yeah. Thank you. We have an interesting topic next. Uh, sex ed from Japan.
Oh, it's a green, huh? Oh. So whenever both of you are ready. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. It's a Saturday night and I'm on the train going home at around 10.30. I'm cautious, nervous, looking around everywhere. The fear of getting groped and sexualized on the train during rush hour courses through my mind. I'm sweating, but I zip up my jacket to make sure I'm covered as much as possible. I spent the next hour riding in the heat, tense and never safe. Despite Japan being one of the safest countries in the world, this fear never disappears. The government has done little to solve this issue, merely creating a UV light stamp to catch sexual assaulters. In school, the sex ed textbooks have fully clothed people and students aren't really learning about the body. The Japanese sexual education system is extremely censored by the government and schools, and this misplaced modesty results in not, in having, in not having a safe and open community to talk about topics like sexual health and sexual assault. Hello, my name is Sabrina. And I'm Adam. And today we want to talk about the Sex Ed Initiative. We decided to take on this project because there is a major problem, lack of proper sexual education in local Japanese junior high schools. According to the Nippon Foundation, more than 40% of Japanese students are dissatisfied with their sexual education, and according to N. Hashimoto and her research paper, 30-35% to 35 don't receive any kind of sexual education. So our solution. The Sex Ed Initiative is a free-to-download app that provides reliable resources for in-depth and uncensored sexual education, current event nudes, and the ability to foster conversations with others. We hope that through education, and creating a movement to push the talk about sexual education for Japanese students, we can give them the opportunity to control their bodies. <clears throat> As for our market strategy, since we and our target audience is relatively young, we want to take advantage of social media platforms to expand our product. We can, also, we can start from our community at ASIJ, uh, our high school, to sell merchandise and start the movement. We are also able to share updates through platforms like Instagram and Snapchat profiles to redirect interested individuals to our app. We plan to start off by advocating and creating a movement to talk about sexual education and uncensored in the Japanese community. This incorporates our initial revenue model by creating a brand and selling merchandise such as sweatshirts, sweatpants, and other goods as this is a popular trend among young people now. This will not only help fund us towards the beginning, but it will also be a means to encourage students to use the app and incentivize them to learn more about sexual health and education. With some previous clothing brands started by students here at our own high school, we know that the reasonable price for sweatshirts would be around $30 to $35. Simply starting sales at our own school would be able to help fund our organization towards the beginning. We, would, we have around 160 students in each grade, and just having one third of each grade buying our merchandise would consist of 212 orders. And that would give us $1,060 for sweatpants and $2,120 for hoodies as often. Although this may be an overestimate, it would still help us in the very beginning. In the future, we also plan to partner with associations such as Advocates for Youth and the UN Sexual and Reproductive Health Agency to gather educational resources that most fit under individuals. So what is our app going to do? As previously mentioned, since our uh, target market is relatively young, we want to take advantage of platforms such as Instagram. Um, pretty much what I mean by this is we want to have a system that is similar to Instagram where people can have the same scrolling through uh, functions and it's something familiar so that uh, kids and teenagers can easily uh, transfer into this app. And on our app, we plan to have four different pages that they can access. The first being uh, primarily current event news around sexual health issues in Japan. This would be passive, uh, interactive resources for learning already pre-filtered for cre credibility and accuracy. Uh, the second one, or the second tab, you could call it, uh, will be kind of an educational learning tab, similar to a Khan Academy, where students can actually create an account and um, sorry, and we'll learn through either videos or properly formatted lectures, and we'll be quizzed after every few lessons to ensure that students are actually making progress. 
These lectures and videos will attempt to guide learners in a way that doesn't feel like they are just reading articles, but will obtain the same information. Uh, in there, they will follow our specially developed curriculum that takes into account facts and statistics in a presentable way. Finally, our third page is going to be kind of our community tab, where there are chat rooms and awareness postings that all people who have created an account can get in touch with each other to actually share ideas around this issue. And then finally, our fourth page would be our store where people can actually buy and look at our products. So regarding our com competition, there is Tout Lifeline Human Rights Now, and there are numerous safety apps out there. So how are we special? Well, many of the resources available are often too vague or do not have specific communities that individuals can relate to. And unfortunately, in a society where people are more reserved and we're talking about sexual related topics is considered too inappropriate, it is, it is important to separate matters that are heavy on society in a vacuum like environment. Many of these organizations fail to properly address the problem because they don't realize that younger students are more reluctant to head towards NGOs or lifelines due to the fear of speaking out against the crowd or the notion of keeping things. So we are more focused on creating a safe environment for the Japanese community specifically and instigating the talk of sexual education and sexual health. <clears throat> so uh, what we've done so far, one of the first things we did was start conversations around sexual education among our peers. We listened and learned to what their experiences were and what they wanted to see more of. Specifically, we learned that students wanted more information on all forms of contraception in Japan. Furthermore, uh, as you can see playing right now, we created a website with information about who we are, links to basic sexual education resources, and our store with our first two products. Uh, with these products, we also intend to include care packages uh, with each purchase, uh, sorry, and these care packages would include condoms, pamphlets, pl pamphlets uh, with basic sex education and lead them to where they can learn more. Our intention with this is not necessarily to encourage sex to young people, but rather to destigmatize conversations about it and actually get the ball rolling. Uh, and get the ball rolling. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. We move on to Q and A. Maybe, maybe I could start. Thank you so much for the great presentation, and you know I really love this as a social initiative. So uh, something that you know I just wanted you to help me clarify was you started off the presentation talking about sexual harassment uh, and then kind of moving on to sex education. Do you have any data like from, let's say, your app or your services that could then help alleviate sexual harassment through this education? Uh, sorry, wh what do you mean by data? Oh, oh, like in the app? It could either be data in the app that you generated or data from your own research findings when you were establishing this project. Um, so basically, when we were starting this project, we were actually searching for government data on this topic. And what we found surprising was that there is lack of data here in Japan because, first of all, people um, in this society, like it's really difficult to come up to actually report these cases. And also the Japanese government has been censoring a lot of things and don't put out the data. So that's kind of why we wanted to start this because we want to get more data out there. And we, we believe that right now, the data that is out there does not represent how much sexual harassment happens here. And that's why we wanted to come at this from an education perspective as well, because of early intervention and learning from it, uh, learning about it from a young age can really help reduce the amount of sexual assault here. Absolutely. And then, you know, my next question is, does your platform have the ability to collect big data and help generate these, this information? Um, as of right now, we don't have that, but I don't see why we couldn't include that into our app. But um, that's not exactly something we had designed into it right at the moment. I think after we can start this movement and just instigate the talk of sexual assault and sexual education here, we could definitely add things such as, um, like I mentioned before, there are a lot of safety apps and people have created things like bracelets, like emergency bracelets, where they report 
um, certain things when they're in danger. And that could easily be sent to the government as data since it's all anonymous and everything. And so I feel like after instigating just the talk of it first, adding things like that would be future plans. Yeah, got it. Thank you very much. Got a question around the contents itself. Um, have you thought about the structure of the contents? Like, because your target audience is more towards uh, a younger audience, um, how would you be positioning the contents um, structure? Would it be more gamified, or is there something else that you're looking at? Yeah. So for uh, mainly with the current news, uh, the posts would not be like full like. New York Post or like Economist articles or like those resources, they would be more short and more concise, just basic information. And then, yeah, in terms of the learning, it would be a lot more interactive and I, I, was, I would say game like, but it's kind of a uh, like in the sense that it's not just all the time like listening and taking notes. Like there is a more interactive side to it. Also, uh, just to go more off that, like when you create a profile, the idea would be that you can go through, like you, it tracks your progress. And so it starts off with a, on a basic level and then you continue through. Um, so even if you leave the app and come back, it doesn't like lose all your progress. You like continue through. All right. Maybe I could ask one more question. Um, so I was just curious, like you, you are targeting a younger demographic, but I feel that a lot of the sexual harassment might happen with older demographics. So, you know, based on their miseducation, right? So, you know, how is your app going to target, you know, let's say, uh, you know, older and younger demographics together and create the best impact? I think we wanted to start with the younger side uh, just because Adam and I are in our teenage year and adolescent years and just based on experiences that me and my female friends have had here in Japan in such a big city, we were more focused on just the early generation and there are definitely issues with older people as well. But I think starting from our education perspective and starting from just early intervention with this education is going to be um, a lot easier than just targeting such a big um, demographic out there because um, this is also very culture related in terms of Japanese culture and that's something really difficult to change. So I think we definitely want to um, integrate this into um, something that's um, accessible to everyone, but definitely starting from the younger generation might be slightly easier. I think also to continue off that, I think giving the young people of Japan more of a voice to then speak up against people from maybe other generations and actually laying the groundwork in the young generation, they will have a stronger voice against uh, the older uh, generations to reform these types of um, misconducts, I guess. Got it. Thank you. Uh, uh, Lin, you're muted. Uh, if you post your question in the chat, we might be able to see it. Um, I think while she's doing that, maybe a question for me. Um, since you guys have been working on this, uh, I think what you're looking at is more uh, of of looking at this as a movement, um, particularly to what Adam you said, um, getting their voices heard. Uh, what has a, what has been the reaction that you have got so far um, with people you have told this idea to? Um, so based on yeah. got it, you got it. Sorry. So based on our conversations that we've had with our peers, we um, it's 
obviously going to be different with the Japanese community itself because we grew up、um, going to international schools with an American education, so sexual education is heavily emphasized. But based on the reactions we've gotten from our、um, we've had lunch discussions and like peer group discussions about sexual health, sexual education, sexual assault here in Japan, we've gotten really positive feedback and we've also gotten feedback where is in、um, That it's more encouraging to have small group discussions, where watching someone else speak out about it is going to help instigate you to want to speak out something from your opinion. And we think this could、um, easily be incorporated in our app. Just having、um, even like online sessions where people are just talking and kind of, I think, empowering each other to speak up and things like that. Uh, and sorry to address the question in the chat.、Uh, the app specifically, the community side of it would be more、uh, kind of chat rooms、uh, where people with accounts、uh, can join different chat rooms. The idea around that is depending on what current、uh, events or like what's going on at that time. There would be different rooms, kind of with different prompts, almost about the discussion, where、um, many different people can join and、uh, talk about、uh, these kind of things. But for making it safer, there is an anonymous feature when joining these chat rooms. So if you're talking about personal experiences that you've had, you don't feel,、um, I guess, publicly embarrassed or worried that other people will see what you're saying and. Like take a screenshot of it, so you can join these rooms like anonymously. Okay, thank you, Edo and Sabrina, for all your really wonderful sharing, especially your Q and A. So now, because of time limit, we'll just move on to the next team as well. Thank yeah. You. yeah. Thank, you. thank you. Okay, the next team that will be coming on is Votis. So I'm sending an invitation to the team. And Huilin, will you want to try and test your mic again? Okay. Can can everyone hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Fortunately, it's pouring rain here, and the、uh, internet is getting yeah. Hi, Leo Rusiki. Can you hear me? I've added you as speaker. Yes, we can hear. Okay, you have、uh, slides to share. Yes. Okay. I think all that's left is Kai. He's is he accepting my invitation? Yeah. So once you're done, you can present your slides. Are my slides appearing? No. Yep. Properly or? Yeah, your speaker notes are showing up. Yeah, so you can click the full screen there. Is this working? Um, not really. Any? Oh,、uh, sorry. Can your can other members of your team try to present? Yeah. Reskill card. Can you try it? Trying to access it right now. You try that again.
Which is this working? Yep. Okay, good to go. Okay, then I'll go ahead. And do it. Global education is as important as ever. We believe the abundance of political, social, and environmental problems can only be solved through the understanding of various cultures. For example, how can you possibly solve, let alone understand, the issue of the Asian population of Japan without having been immersed in the Japanese culture? WOTUS is an online platform where students can immerse themselves in foreign cultures. We believe our platform can serve as a way to raise global citizens who are much needed in current society. Through WOTUS, everyone in the world will have equal access to any culture from around the world. According to Access Lead, 34.8% of foreign students in Japan indicated that their reason for studying in Japan is because of their interest in Japanese culture such as anime and manga. Lotus will tap on these Japanese cultural interests that foreigners have. Our initial target is foreign students interested in Japanese culture. As we grow, we would like to make WOTUS a platform where you can immerse yourself in the cultures of every single country in the world and connect the people who share the same interests. We conducted a survey that included 67 foreign students who currently go to international schools in Japan. And through the survey results, we identified anime as being the most popular interest that foreigners have towards Japanese culture. Some other interests included J-pop, Japanese cuisine, and traditional Japanese sports. These are the steps our customers will go through using Lotus. The user will first select a country of interest and in there users will find cultural interests pertain to that specific country. Each cultural interest will have its own unique homepage with links to various activities including a 24-7 zoom link, featured rooms, and chat feature. Now I'll hand it over to Ryusuke and he will go over the customer so this is what our website looks like. Our homepage consists of options for countries around the world, of which six are currently shown. Once clicking on a country, Japan for example, you will see several cultural interests interest displayed. Inside each cultural interest is a thread open 24-7 consisting of a chat function, feature groups, and a video conferencing link. In addition, to bolster exchange on a common interest between people from various backgrounds, we will incorporate an automatic language translator in the chats and the video calls. This is an example of what a featured room looks like. It is an anime watch party that happened in a feature group for the anime cultural interest. In this case, we watched the trending anime series Kimetsu no Yaiba together while discussing our thoughts. After exiting the session, Participants would fill out a survey, indicating some other interest they have where a thread is yet to be made. Once the amount of interest exceeds a specific thresh threshold, a new feature group will be made. Furthermore, we will test our product using Product Hub, a popular site where many designers, website developers, and investors exchange ideas and collaborate to enhance each other's entrepreneurial endeavors. This will become an effective source of feedback for us where we can experiment with new ideas as well. These are some of our costs we will incur. First, we will invest in the IBM Watson real-time system to translate our chat content and provide subtitles in our video calls to over 68 languages. This costs $15 per month. Furthermore, our website platform, Wix, will cost $12 per month to gain access to have our own domain various add-ons to maximize user experience. Similar to Discord, we believe that a web-based platform will meet the demands of our users the most, and we will develop an app after gaining traction on our website. Next, Kai will talk about the logistics. We'll deliver our product to customers in four ways. First, through forming partnerships with companies who have similar goals with respect to spreading cultures, we'll be able to reach our customer base. Next, by advertising our service on prominent social media platforms, we'll be able to specifically attract our market of students. In addition, our website-based platform using existing infrastructure will enable a wide range of students to access our service. And lastly, we'll incentivize students by offering volunteering opportunities for them to teach about their culture 
to foreign students of different cultures. A revenue will be generated through advertisements in the form of CPMs and CPCs, two of the most common pricing methods for online ads. Advertisements that are relevant to the interest group within each culture will enable companies to attract desired customers while allowing the customers to explore services that are related to their interests. In addition, we'll generate revenue from company-run events through a one-time payment system for a designated period of time. As you can see, our projected revenue is calculated by adding the revenue from advertisements as well as the one-time fees that companies will pay to host their event on our platform. Initially, we'll focus on establishing a customer base rather than generating revenue since we have low costs and can afford to incur short-term losses. However, our business will quickly generate profit in the near future. We believe that as our customer base grows, companies will be willing to pay higher prices to hold events on our platform to tap into our customers. Now with an idea of the why and the what, who exactly will you be investing in? Leo, Yusuke, and I have extensive experience with starting a business and networking with people of all age groups and backgrounds through a successful founding of an entrepreneurship council, JBEC, that consists of over 500 high school students across Japan. Through running this organization, we have connections with top business professionals from various industries in Japan and overseas. To top it off, we have Japanese, French, and background, which will be essential to capture our initial target market, as well as interacting with students globally to expand this venture. WOTUS, the effective solution to connect the students virtually around the world to immerse themselves in a di diverse range of sectors, is only part of what you'll be investing in. Our shared passion for solving problems, our deep understanding of the Japanese, American, and French culture, and experience running a successful organization make us a powerful team to take this company to the next level, to ignite the spark in students to gain their competitive edge of global immersion and foreign cultures. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Moving to Q&A. Yeah, good job, guys. Um, are you guys in an international school in Japan? Yes. Yes, all three of us. Yeah, I, I, th I think you, you've hit spot on on uh, because of your current location, what are the interest areas that you would be able to naturally put up on the platform. Um, I guess feedback for me, the first thing that I really like is that you're not waiting to build your product. Um, you're not waiting for for your platform to be built before you actually build your product and push it out to your uh, potential user. So the watch party that you guys did was a brilliant idea to see um, how the experience would be like for people who are engaging with you on this on these topics. Um, I think the topics that you picked, especially the ones that are related to Japan, um, food, um, culture, arts, I think those are uh, perfect topics for what you are looking to do. Um, from a revenue perspective, do you think that's an important thing for you to, to solve from day one? Or um, is engagement and getting attention for this a lot more important? Which, which is, what's your thoughts around that? Well, as we sort of initially mentioned in the previous slides, our main focus, at least in the, uh, I guess, next month or so, will be to gather the customers to expand it and to make it more well-known, to get more recognition. Um, and seeing as we have low costs, we think we have the ability to incur some possibly short-term losses as they are very low. Um, and so our focus will be to sort of gather this recognition first before focusing on the revenue aspect of it. Yeah, uh, I, I really like that you say that because um, revenue, while revenue is a, is a focus for most entrepreneurial uh, um, initiatives, I think the harder thing to come by is actually attention. And if you have an interest topic like anime and, and an audience that, that not just in Japan, but around the world, that you can engage on that, um, topic. I think that is uh, really important. Um, the key thing that you may need to look at is when you're pro providing free content now, like an anime watch party, and you switch towards uh, sponsored content, um, the level of engagement typically will drop once there is sponsorship involved. Um, that's something I think you need to to to, to take note of and, and see from a, an engagement perspective how you can also help your advertisers who might be wanting to reach out to their audience. Um, create a format that is still engaging even though it's sponsored content. Um, have you guys looked at uh, which corporations would be um, good examples for the first few advertisers on your platform? So one of them is this uh, Japanese website called Kikoma, which is a uh, manga 
It's this manga uh, website. So I guess that would be a great one for especially the mong- manga interest group within the Japanese uh, culture sort of subgroup. That would be a great and relevant uh, company for them to tap into, seeing as uh, foreign students still have opportunity to access this website and that website um, will be able to gather additional customers um, through being a sponsor of our program with users of um, similar interests and passions. Yeah, just a follow-up question um, from Ryan. So I'm just wondering, because right now a lot of countries, especially like Japan, which are a very big tourist destination, uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic are utilizing sort of advertising as well as virtual platforms to engage future tourists. And that could also be, you know, the student demographic as well, the international student demographic. So I'm just curious, are you working uh, with, let's say, the hospitality and tourism sector? and you know just curious how that fits into your your model um oh i can go um we're not necessarily uh looking i guess it's more about like cultural immersion but what we're hoping is that you can do that online without like the needs of like traveling and things so that our plan is to remain relevant even after this whole COVID situation. So right now, yes, it's a great opportunity because everything is online um, and people are in need of like connections. Well, we think that there's an opportunity outside just this COVID situation. And I guess one way would be like with the tourism department, I feel like if people go on our platform, and harvest their interest in like various cultures, we might be able to like boost the like traveling, make more traveling happen. And like possibly that could reboot the economy after, but COVID aside, I feel like we could maintain our like relevance even after, and that can come in various ways. Also adding on to that, but I think it's a great idea to capitalize on this COVID situation because it is the initiative of the Japanese government, as well as many local universities, to take this, I guess, advantage to advertise towards foreign students, even when they can't come to Japan right now, because when the whole COVID situation is hopefully over, or even if it's not, they need to find new ways to attract students. So it it is a really attractive um, potential partnership that we could create in the next few months. And also adding on to that, the current administration is really pushing for foreign companies to uh, sort of move in, into uh, Japan, seeing as there's uh, Japan's Tokyo, especially this is seen as this new city um, where foreign companies have the opportunity to build and expand here. So we think that the, although we're initially targeting students, we could also expand this to um, expats and those sort of companies and in, individuals to adults, a uh, more wide ranging age group. Um, once we sort of established our uh, students and we think we starting with students because we're we have more knowledgeable about them um, and it makes sense for us to tap into that market first Quilin can hear you Just, again. Or you can tap out your question if you want. We just ran out of time for the Q and A. Yeah, you can reply your question in the chat. The question, I can, I can, You can still post it. I'll just give them another couple of seconds to answer that.
Are you guys reading the question? Okay. Yeah, I completely agree with what Huiling is saying. I don't think you guys are cultural exchange. I think you guys are interest, interest focus. And I honestly see you guys, instead of building a platform, I see you guys streaming on Twitch. <laughs> Okay, thanks guys. We'll move on to our last team, uh, Tinker. Welcome back, Tinker. You guys participated in the Beijing Young Founders Summit last year, right? Are they are they on yet? Okay, just wait for them to come on stage. Everybody. Hi. Hello. Hello. Is Arif coming in as well? Yep, he should be in. Quilling, I think there are audio issues on your earpiece. Yeah, look at yeah, still coming here. Yep. Hello, everyone. Okay. Yep. Okay, great. Welcome back, guys. Um, Thank you. Ready whenever you are. Thank you. Hi and good day everyone. I am Sayasha and I'm here today and I'm going to be telling you a short story. Once I followed my mom to the hypermarket and as usual there are two sections to it, the organic vegetables and the normal veggie section. I have always wanted to buy from the organic section because the vegetables looked really fresh and appealing. But due to the tight budget, we never really got to do so. Instead, we wake up early in the morning and spend hours and hours looking for the best and most fresh looking vegetables. This routine went on, but one incident made me flabbergasted. I saw the shop owner dipping brinjals into colored water. And I went on asking what it was and got to know that it was actually a chemical that was used to preserve the vegetables longer. I was disappointed and sad that it did not even feel safe consuming vegetables anymore. As I was sharing this experience with my friends, we realized that this was a problem that not only I faced, but everyone out there that wants to eat healthy. On average, leafy organic vegetables are about 15 ringgit, while non-organic is 7. You wonder why organic vegetables are an elitist product only available for certain demographics access to organic food is a human right and everyone deserves it we realized that it was a concerning issue and had to do something about it. And it is as simple as gardening at home. But why aren't we doing it? It is due to the lack of space, time, knowledge, and no interest. But no need to worry. Here at Thinker, we are introducing to you Fito, your next-gen gardening experience that allows you to pop in your seed, sit back, relax, and watch your organic crops grow. It is an urban indoor farming kit that is fully automated and comes with a mopa. Yep. Here are the interesting features. Firstly, its adaptive lighting helps boost the growth of vegetables. With the help of AI, our lighting feature adapts to the condition of the plants based on its growth and changes accordingly. No space at home? Don't worry, it is modular, which allows users to tailor fit it according to their needs. As there is no such thing as one size fits all, users will be able to put on add-on features in the future. With AI monitoring, all you have to do is wait for it to grow. And there's a specially formulated medium that maximizes nutrient absorption, which is organic. Next is the Fito app, which is integrated with the Fito kit. By taking advantage of IoT, we're able to allow the user to monitor the device remotely via the app. While the onboard AI monitoring system will notify the user once the vegetables mature, but the app has other features too. 
First is the wiki plant, your one-stop planting library. Next is the Vegidex, where you can record your planting journey. Finally, we have Farmers Hub, a community platform where you can connect, share, explore, but most importantly, learn new things about the farming world. Once we get our initial investments, the wheel have been set into motion, and we'll be pushing the product for 300 ringgit, 350 ringgit for the Fito starter kit. The kit comes with 12 pots capable of 62 kilograms of organic crops annually, meaning you only have to spend 350 ringgit to get 930 ringgit worth of organic vegetables. So the users will be able to break even within one year. Our revenue streams are subscription from the app and kit purchases. And with a 28% profit margin, with a thousand users by the end of the year, we'll be able to break even by year one, by month seven. Fito creates a self-sustaining community by allowing users to grow crops independently in virtually any indoor space. Furthermore, Fito is hassle-free, so you don't have to get your hands dirty or even constantly monitor it. Next, Fito creates a stress-relieving environment, as growing plants in dark can help improve your well-being in multiple ways, leading to productive days. Lastly, Fito grows organic crops, so users will have access to organic food. If you took, take a look at the bigger picture, Fito also comes in line with its two UN SDGs. It indirectly contributes to zero hunger, but as users will be able to grow their own crops, that increases the production of vegetables as the population grows. Next, it creates sustainable city as growing your own crop food reduces the environmental impact of agriculture and creates greener cities because with one Fito kit, you can reduce greenhouse gases emission caused by food import. Our target audience are those living in urban areas wanting to eat organic. As of today, globally, the total market size available is 2.2 billion. In Malaysia, we have a market size of approximately 12 million urban residents, while in Kuala Lumpur, 4 million urban residents. And as you can see, these numbers are expected to increase by 2030. Even taking 1% of the market share in Kuala Lumpur today is already a large market. So, how will our product reach the market? We will approach green housing developers, restaurants, and even supermarkets. And with the current trend of sustainability and indoor farming, Users can also purchase our device via the app, social media, and online shopping platforms, allowing us to jump on the hype train. We provide online support and give users free tutorials on Fito's Farmers Hub. However, we do acknowledge that we have competitors in the market. What makes us unique? Well, Fito is customizable, allowing for infinite expansion. The Farmers Hub and community on the app adds value to the product that allows everyone to interact and share their experience as well as gain rewards. AI tracking allows for full automation. Data collected can be used for plant identification and users can monitor their plants in real time and not miss out on their gardening experience. Thinker started a year ago with a strong passion and determination. As a team, we have won national and international competitions. And with you today, we have Arif, Sayasha, and Chan Hyu Yan. And we are from Thinker. We do have a few collaborators, which are three we would like to highlight. Firstly, we have Plant OS as our technical consultant. We also have Talkland that are willing to provide us hydroponics kit for R&D. And finally, Sunway iLabs that are willing to give support for testing and commercializing it. Beyond this, we have a few future plans in mind. Here, a thinker. We imagine a better and more sustainable future. And today, we have introduced to you our vision of the future. In our FITO kits, we provide a superior quality and a one-of-a-kind gardening experience. And by democratizing organic vegetables, we provide the users the option to eat organically and affordably. Get ready for your next generation of gardening experience. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Moving on to Q&A. Um, good job, guys. Is your product ready for the market? Do you have a prototype that's already built or um, what stage are you guys at right now? Um, we have a prototype or like a small prototype that we've created. Sai, would you like to play the video? Yep. I'll be going there. So we basically have done a few prototypes, but the latest one is this. So um, we would like to just play it real quick. It's, this is just two parts, but in the real life, it's going to be 12 parts. 
and the design is going to be similar. We are currently at our final stage of MVP. So we have refined it along the year as we have done three pro two prototypes. Firstly, it was a bulky, a huge one, but now we have narrowed it down and we're currently at this stage. Okay. And uh, from an electronics perspective, all your sensors are in this current prototype? Yeah. What, what yeah, do you currently yes. monitor for? Um, humidity. Um, humidity, we use an ultrasonic sensor also to monitor the water level and also a Raspberry Pi camera on top to just use our algorithm to detect the rate of growth of the plant. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I really like your story. Um, the design that you showed with the, that video, the it looks really nice. Um, if that product is available in the market right now, I'll definitely buy it. Um, I think where, where there is a bit of a problem with your story is that you started off with growing your own crops, but your limitation is that um, in terms of the design that you have for the product, one is about 70, 80 uh, US dollars uh, per pop. But there is a limitations in terms of space. So you do have uh, quite a lot of tech monitoring a very small area of your crop. Uh, but if you're able to build this out into a design that would allow me to grow multiple crops, leveraging basically the same tech, I think that's a lot more um, affordable for, 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 for your users, which are basically CD dollars. Um, actually, our product does not only grow one crop, it can actually grow multiple crops at the same time. And this is currently what we're developing. At this phase, we can grow leafy, organic leafy, leafy vegetables, as well as uh, simple vegetables like tomatoes and um, cherry tomatoes and things like that. So definitely, it will be able to grow multiple vegetables at the same time. Yeah. Okay. What, you, what do you guys need to? What do you guys need to make this product a reality? All right. What do you guys okay. need um, in order to make this product uh, a reality so that you can go to market? Yeah. So first things first, we require more funding. So in our um, initial investments, we would require some, uh, somewhere around 50,000 ringgit to first um, first outsource our manufacturing and hire uh, industrial designers, integrated circuit designers, and people who can manage our logistics sites. And then after that, we have to start uh, focusing on the development side and manufacturing side. So we have to start approaching manufacturers and everything. And before we start fundraising and actually going into market. Okay. There are a few investors in the room, so I'll let them ask you questions. Thank yeah. you. Hi, it's good to see you guys again. Um, but definitely, I just wanted to challenge you on this. Uh, how would you compare yourself uh, with products in the market right now? Right, like companies like Click and Grow, for example, yep. um, they have they have very good uh, kind of systems. Um, but I just want to hear more from you. So I know they are okay. very big, but how different would you be from them? Okay, so as we can see here, the comparison of our product, we have an onboard uh, monitoring. So let's just specifically see Click and Grow. Click and Grow, their system is modular but they do not have any um, onboard monitoring. So what does this onboard monitoring means? Because we're looking forward um, to making it fully automated. So how we do this is to prevent people from you know, constantly going and checking on their vegetables, see if they have to water it. And along with that, our app actually adds value. So this will be leading. So okay, we'll go, we'll go through this first. So the onboard monitoring allows users to monitor their plants via the app. So if they need to refill the water, they'll be they'll be notified instead of going and tracking on it. Next is integrated with an app. So how are we different is that our product has this farmer's community and real-time monitoring. So farmer's community is basically where all the people out there who has our product or even external farmers can come in in the community and they can communicate about the products and if there is anything that goes wrong, instead of coming and telling us the problem, they can actually discuss and solve it. So we can actually identify the problems in advance. And if they're they are willing to grow vegetables and they're going to be cooking using the vegetables, they can definitely post it up on the farmer's community. So it creates a more sustainable community instead of just one person. And finally, is real time. So real time monitoring, that leads to our AI feature. So AI feature is something that we have unique compared to everything out there because we'll be able to identify the type of plants you based on the data that is being collected. So as a whole, we are modular, customizable. The farmers community create a sustainable community. The app itself, the app and the AI creates the add-on feature compared to even click and grow. Right. Thank you. Okay, we are running out of time, unfortunately. So we we'll probably need to wrap up for this uh, session. Thank you, guys. Uh, 
Okay. I think before we, we, we end this group, I just want to say a few things. First of all, uh, I'd like to say a big thank you to all the judges, right, for really taking time off uh, to participate in this. In you know, your, I think uh, your questions have added a lot of value and providing the guidance to help sharpen their ideas. Uh, and that's very, very helpful. Thank you for that. And I think um, before I end, I saw just a note to all the teams out there who participated this round. Um, I think you guys are truly an inspiring uh, change makers, right? I mean, not only do you guys have brilliant ideas in wanting to make a positive impact in this world, right? But you guys actually took action, and that is important, right? You guys are not sitting by the side watching and waiting for things to happen. So I hope you guys will continue with this spirit, right? And continue to uh, uh, not just think of ideas, but actually bring ideas to reality. I think that's important. Thank you, guys. So, uh, Perlin? Perlin? Can you hear me? Yeah, I think uh, we need to go back. Can you guide the team to where to go to next? Yep, so if you were to look at the event page or what I've just posted in the session page as well, now we'll be having a talk by Will Fund. So for everyone here, and even for the speakers, after I end this session, you can click on the sessions in the left side and click to join the Becoming the Entrepreneur later. Yeah, thank you. And we hope that everyone really enjoyed the pitching because I felt like I did and I gained a lot as well. Thank you so thank much, you. everyone. Thank you. Thank you.